Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing animal welfare and safety with guest Liz Scrobish, Executive Director of the Animal Rescue League of Southern Rhode Island. Dr. Edward Chitino, President and CEO of the Animal Rescue League of Boston, and Carrie Burns, CEO of the Santa Barbara Humane. We so often are dealing with topics of tremendous weight. We deal with poverty and race and education and, and all these different issues. And we neglect the everyday pleasures of life, but also the management that is involved in ensuring that the pets that live with us, the animals that live around us, that they are healthy and that our relationship with them are healthy. So let's talk about that process, particularly during the COVID era. We've all seen this boom in, in pets, kitty cats and dogs and, and uh, so on being adopted. So Liz, let's start with you. Could you just talk a little bit about the work of the Animal Rescue League? And then we're gonna go around the table and, and then let's, let's talk about how these, these organizations are managed, the programs that you offer us, and the services that you provide to civil society. Liz? Sure. First, thank you so much for inviting me here today, Mark. The Animal Rescue League of Southern Rhode Island, it's actually also known as Animal Rescue Rhode Island. Um, our focus here is adoptions, primarily cats, dogs, and small animals. But in addition to adoptions, we have other programs. We have a community pet pantry that services the state and we have our humane education programs called Ari Animal Scholars. And I'm happy to go into that a little bit more later, but that's who we are here in Rhode Island. So you're doing adoption, adoptive services, but you're also providing educational support to us uh, uh, pet owners and to, to others. And you also are, are bringing families together to talk about this idea of caring for another being, right? Absolutely. Our programs are designed for children, ages kindergarten through 12th grade, and they're not only designed to teach those children about various aspects of animal care, but also to give them messages that they can take home to their families and share with their families so that the entire family is really getting that education. Um, our signature program, Playing It Safe with Dogs, it's a dog bite prevention program that actually never uses the word bite. But we reach out to students in the early years to talk about that and to go through the process of educating them precisely so that they can stay safe around the dogs in their lives. On the flip side, we have a program for adults. It's called Pet Meets Baby. It's how to prepare your pet when a new baby is coming into the house. Because every year we hear about tragedies resulting from family pets getting disturbed by this new being in the home, and they don't recognize it as a baby. And so we allow the, our participants to, to ask all kinds of questions, and we give them all sorts of information designed to prepare them for a safe environment for both the pet and the baby. Now, Edward, your, your uh, work in Boston kind of overlaps, but you also have other programs that have dimension to these, to these services. Could you just describe the, the view from Boston, from the Animal Rescue League's perspective, and also give us a, a real sense of your history, because you have a, a, quite a long history. No, thank you, Mark. So our organization, the Animal Rescue League of Boston, is over 122 years old. Uh, we have three locations throughout Massachusetts, Boston, Dedham, and on Cape Cod. We have an animal care and adoption centers in each of those locations. We also provide mobile community services and community programs to communities in great need that I'll talk a little bit more about. We also have an advocacy department that also that helps legislate for animal welfare issues in the state of Massachusetts, a humane law enforcement department. We have a field services department and we have a veterinary hospital as well. So we have a very integrated um, system for animal health. For example, if law enforcement goes to respond to a case, our field services team helps respond to remove the animals from the situation. And if there aren't any laws in Massachusetts to help prevent this from happening, our advocacy, advocacy team gets to work to help create something to prevent this from happening in the future. So we, we really look at it, a holistic approach to animal welfare. And one of the things we're most proud about is we started this before COVID and COVID really amplified the need. We really try to focus on how do we keep pets out of our care? How do we keep pets with families and keep that family unit together? Animals are part of the family. And in order to do that, 
we realized we needed to be in communities. We needed to remove barriers and provide access to low cost or no cost veterinary care. So we've identified communities, underserved communities, COVID really amplified this. So we have mobile units that are out in communities around greater Boston that provide low cost or no cost wellness for dogs or cats and no cost or low cost spay or neuter services for dogs or cats throughout Southern Massachusetts and Boston as well. Really doing everything we can to keep the family unit together before the animal um, human bond is broken and people call us to surrender their pet, really trying to remove those, remove those barriers. And we're going to get to a whole bunch of different issues. We're going to get to the issues of, of urban areas that are overrun by uh, feral animals, but also more rural areas, more natural areas. And you see this in Santa Barbara, where, uh, as well as on Cape Cod, where you don't want to have feral uh, animals attacking bird populations and other uh, population. So we'll get to those uh, those issues. But Carrie, could you give us the the uh, perspective from Santa Barbara on your sure. work? Thanks. Well, first off, it's really warm out here. But um, besides <laughs> that, uh, we've been around since 1887. So Edward, I think we have you beat. We're one of the oldest uh, humane organizations in the United States. So we bring a lot of history with us, but we kind of fall in between Liz and, and Edward with what they both do. We don't do the, you know, the, the cruelty and animal control portion like Edward does. And we don't do as much education as what Liz does. What we provide is adoptions, access to veterinary care, because like Ed, Edward was saying, that's so important that we learned during COVID. And we do a lot of behavior and training. In 2020, we merged two of the largest humane organizations. And we really focused on, as Edward was saying, how do we keep pets in the family? We extended our safety net programs. So Mark, if you came in and said, I can't afford food, it would cost us less as an organization to give you food to keep the animal in your home than to take them into our care. Let's say you can't afford you know, to have a surgery for your animal. We have funding because every single SPCA and humane organization is a local organization. So all the funds come in the community and stay in the community. We're not connected to any national organization. So the community gives back each time they help a local organization, which in that regard, we can provide you know, different veterinary care keep the animal in the home, and it's just a win-win for everybody. So we're really looking at, we changed the way because of COVID that we looked at our business and we said, what does the community need at this point? Because for humans, COVID was a horrible, horrible issue. For animals, it was a gift. All these animals got adopted. And now how do we keep that bond alive? And that's what we've really been focusing on with our safety net programs as we move forward. And just to be clear, when you're talking about training, who are you talking about training? Mm, good question. It works at both ends of the leash there, Mark. Uh, basically, you have to train the humans in order to get the correct behavior from the animal. And we only work with positive reinforcement. We do not do the blended type of training, nor do we do corrective training. Because positive reinforcement, you'll get much further and make a longer lasting effect for you, your family, and the animal. You know, it, it strikes me that if you if you think in a very interconnected way, you're basically helping us to learn about how to treat each other as well as treating our animals. Um, could, could you all comment in terms of the effect that you see in terms of civil society? If, if we think about that, that we are trying to deal with, with issues, as you said, Edward, as you said, Liz, as you said, Carrie, in terms of the treatment of animals and the health of animals and so on and so forth. But are we also, in a sense, um, uh, taking this opportunity to think about, in a very purposeful way, how we act, how we interact? Liz, um, how, how do you think about, about this, this larger uh, part of the mission? I think this really speaks to the heart of who we are. Um, I mean, pets are family and families make up communities. So it's, it's, it's for us a through, a through line right there. And to Carrie's point in COVID, um, yes, it was hard and it still is. And we saw, for example, cars lined up at food banks, people going out to get food for their families, but nowhere there was there consideration for what happens to the pets. And to their point of let's try to prevent pets from being surrendered, let's keep them in the home, our community food pantry exploded in terms of the number of clients served, the number of pets who are now dependent on us 
for distributing con food, even if it's contactless delivery, we make the, the trip and we work through other agencies as well for a statewide distribution. I think that there's nothing in the community that does not involve animals. When you look at the number of animals in the community that are owned, the number of animals in the community that are potentially at risk at any given time, I think we have to link all of that together. In terms of, of some of the, um, the nuts and bolts, Edward, in terms of the work that you do, could you just sort of describe um, in terms of the investment of your budget, how you divide the, uh, the resources amongst your different programs and where your emphasis lies in terms of spending? What is the thing that costs the most? And what is it the thing that, that, that your constituents need the most from you? It's the thing that costs the most. That was, that's a great question. So our organization has fee-for-service revenue that comes in. It's through our adoption services, through our veterinary care, through our dog training courses. So we have we have a ways of bringing in revenue into the organization. So fee-for-service, so people are paying you for your services, and that right. sustains the organization as well. Correct. That funds about a third of the organization. However, the remaining comes from private foundations and private donations. And what costs us the most is providing all of our community programs. We have our mobile units that are in communities, purchasing the mobile unit, subsidizing the care, um, staffing the supplies for those mobile units. We're, if people are only, if we're charging folks $10, for a wellness exam for their dogs or cats. That, that's for the exam, the veterinary exam on any vaccine that dog or cat needs, any flea treatment, heartworm treatment, ear treatment, skin treatment. And we realized we used to say only $10 until we were corrected by somebody in the community that says it's only $10 for you. For us, this $10 is a lot. So now we say it's $10. And if people don't have $10, it's totally fine. We will still see their pet. That cost, that's a significant cost to the organization. Spaying and neutering as well. We have a large mobile unit that we spay and neuter. It's on the road four days a week. The staffing um, for that unit is, is quite expensive and, and the supplies as well. And so there's, we could only charge a certain amount of money. Otherwise, it's not, it's not providing access to spay or neuter. And that's what we want to do. The majority of folks that we're serving really want and need care for their pets. They live in animal resource deserts animal resource deserts where there aren't any veterinary clinics. There aren't any places to buy high quality pet food. There aren't any places to buy leashes or cat litter or things like that. So we're in communities that really need care for their pets. And if it's not provided, what happens? Over time, they'll then surrender their pet. And as Carrie mentioned, it's less expensive for us as an organization to provide the supplies and resources to people that really wanna keep their pet than them to surrender their pet and what makes us think we're going to find a better home for that pet when they're already living in a home that loves them very, very, very much. So it's all very, happy. very You'll be happy, Edward, to know that all the people who responded to our last question about spaying and neutering, everybody talked about uh, spaying and, and accepting that necessity uh, to, to make sure that their, their pets are, are spayed and neutered. But you're making a really important point. What you're saying is that your organization functions as a corrective to imbalances of income, to, um, you know, in terms of, of, of a justice organization and, and ensuring that people are bound together and are treated with dignity and, and you meet people where they live. You're being educated by the constituents that you're served. That $10, that's $10 to you. It's only $10 to us, but it's, it's $10. It's $10. We might not be able to afford it, and you're saying, okay, I hear you. Let's change our attitudes. So you're being you're being educated as well. Uh, uh, Carrie, are you finding that you have this same kind of, of dynamic with your constituents where your constituents are educating you and telling you that you you haven't necessarily been serving us as smartly as you ought to and you need to adjust? Everyone wants to tell you how to do their job. Um, <laughs> that's just the way it is at the end of the day. You know, that's the one thing that we did during COVID is we really we we put surveys out. We listen to our community. We were building a new strategic plan around the needs of the community. You know, we're very different than Boston. We're very different than Edward. We're very different Former. than Liz in, in our 
Yeah, in our much warmer, um, in just our our makeup of our county here itself. But we really did listen because we're here to serve the community, and every donor dollar that comes in touches you know to save a life. It's just not me. It's not just my staff doing the work. It's every community member. The minute you step foot on our property, and whether you're using our services or giving us you know ten dollars to help another ten dollars. Your money just keeps revolving and your, your gift keeps revolving to save another animal's life and help another family stay together. So we listen to that and we say, how can we do that more effectively? Because I think in our industry, and Liz and Edward, I think you'll agree, in the past, we've been very judgmental about people adopting or about people bringing in an animal and it looks like it's been beaten up and we blame the person. You know, animals can teach us so much about non-judgment. And, you know, animals were the first to have DEI included in their, their breeds. But, you know, I think we've really listened. We do, we are a socially conscious shelter. We do conversational adoptions. So, Mark, we would talk to you. You might want to come in and adopt Fluffy, but we're going to ask you questions about you and your lifestyle and your needs, because we want to make that that match be the best match that it can be. So for you, it's not about getting, getting a, um, a, an animal off of your books Mm-mm. or out of your shelter. It's actually trying to improve lives. Exactly. It's making the right match and it's improving lives. And think about it. Any corporation would know this. The more turnover you have in staff, the more it's going to cost you. The more turnover we have in the animals, it can cost us more. And it creates more stress for the animal. Anytime you move, especially people that have cats, you know this, if you move your cat from one place to another, try to take them to the vet, you've disrupted their entire life for the next seven years. So we try to have the right conversation, make the right match. So we've reduced the overall stress, A, of the animal, but B, of the person coming here and going, because two reasons why people don't want to enter these shelters, they'll say two things. Oh, I would cry if I went there or I want to take them all home. We want to remove that and let them have a really good experience. So bringing all that together and meeting everybody in the middle really works well at the end of the day. I like the point about non-judgmental because we're all coming from different places, right? And we really ought to look at people, meet people where they are, but we we rarely do. Animals meet you where they are, right? I mean, they're, they do. they're basically... <laughs> interacting with you as, as, as an independent being. Liz, you focus a lot on, on education and you, and you talked about the fact that your, uh, many of your programs focus on children. Do you have programs for adults as well um, or, or people of different circumstances that are shaped to meet people at, at that place, either in their, in their older age or um, in their different circumstance? Um, we do have some in development. We have only a couple that we're currently giving. Um, and as I as I start speaking about that, I do want to also dovetail to something that Carrie just mentioned, which I think is really critically important. And it was a lesson learned in COVID. And that is that prior to COVID, our shelter was open and people could just visit when they wanted to. And that was fabulous for people who wanted to bring groups of children or fathers who had their kids on a Sunday and needed to do something with them for a period of time. That was great. But what we discovered in COVID was that having a schedule, working by appointment only, means that the animals get some downtime. And it means that we, our staff, gets to do exactly what Carrie was describing, which is to really have a conversation about making a good match. And they get more personalized attention because we don't have a shelter full of people, all of whom we sort of have to keep an eye on or be available to. So you um, learned that, that maybe you can moderate going forward. Exactly. You know, that's that's think, really interesting, this, this idea. Yeah. Um, Edward, did you find the same, did you have the same kind of experience? Did you find that, you're, that you learned a little bit about how to manage your operation more efficiently through this COVID experience? We, we learned a bunch of things, yes. Um, in short, the answer is yes. We, We've, we've done the approach, as Carrie mentioned, and as Liz mentioned, with the conversational adoption approach. We call it adoption forward, where we're really, it's almost like a dating game where we're trying to make the right connection. You come in to adopt this dog you saw online. We ask you questions about your life and you realize you're not the right fit. We 
we try to let people know we really want to make the right connections. That's the most important thing to us. We want to, we want to set up success. That's what we want to do for the animal and for the person. COVID made us really reevaluate a lot of things. And, and one is we went to appointment only, as, as Liz mentioned, where it really let our staff kind of focus on themselves, which is very important because they, they needed to come into work every single day to take care of the animals when the rest of the world was shutting down. They had to get up, get up, leave their house and come to work to take care of the pets in our care. We also realized our supporters stepped up. All of when Massachusetts went into a lockdown, we didn't want our animals in our care and our shelters. We put a call out to all of our foster families. 450 animals left our shelters to go into foster families because we did not know how long the lockdown was going to happen. So all these animals left our shelters into foster families so they could spend time in a real home until we're able to figure out when we could start our adoption process. And it opened up our shelter to take in an animals that needed to be surrendered or law enforcement cases. So that really- In many respects, you're talking about frontline workers. I'm sorry to interrupt, but, you're, yes. but I want to just emphasize this. Um, one of the vectors of transmission for COVID were animals. It, it was questionable um, how ad- people contract COVID from animals. It, it kind of, ha- Eved, ebbed and flowed. People thought they contracted from their animals and people are wiping down their dogs and it turns out COVID can't live on surfaces. So it's, it's some animals do contract COVID. It's still questionable about how that happens and if it goes from people to animals or vice versa. So it's still, the jury's still out on that officially, I believe. Thank you. Thank you for the correction. I had, I had read an article about uh, vectors of transmission, uh, particularly through dogs, actually, yep. is, is what the article uh, was about. Um, uh, we just had a, a, um, a uh, poll ended and we asked, what are the biggest uh, reasons pet owners sometimes fail to properly care for their pets? And the two largest uh, answers, the two, the two answers receiving the, the greatest response was lack of time, space or money, which you've all addressed. And then there's also uh, motivated, but a lack of understanding, which you've also addressed through, through your uh, education program. Can we turn um, a little bit to, um, to programs that um, uh, you, Carrie, and uh, you, Edward, um, are uh, perhaps a little bit more um, uh, aligned toward addressing? And that is the whole issue of, of pets that, that are without owners. Um, and the harm that they do uh, in various uh, settings. Carrie, can you just uh, sort of weigh in in, in terms of uh, what you are finding? So we're talking now about pets, not who have owners, not who are neglected, not, not pets that are neglected with owners, and you're trying to sort of figure out that situation. But you're talking about uh, pets that with, without owners and what kind of harm that does before they come into the shelter and that you're also trying to ameliorate. Right. So there's there's twofold. I would say, you know, animals without owners. Um, one would be feral cats. I will put them in that category because there are no owners there. And we are actually we're expanding our, our TNR program, our trap, neuter and, and return. So feral cats have a job. Um, you know, where they're living for the most part, if you control it properly. Uh, for example, when I was in Chicago, we, we went to the city of Chicago and said, hey, let's not put poison down. Let's use some feral cats to get rid of the rats that are as big as the cats in Chicago. But, you know, that so that was a process. So we offer free traps. People can take them out. We offer certain days that we'll do um, spaying and neutering here. So we work with that program. When it comes to other unowned animals, it's a matter of we do our own in-house assessments to determine safety and health best that we can. We can't guarantee you know, everything for all animals, um, but we try to get as much of a story as we can about that animal before it goes into a home. And sometimes we use our foster parents to give us even more of a story. So that's really, again, how the community can help us to determine certain parameters. Maybe this dog is great with kids, maybe it's not. We might not know some of those things, but we need to be honest with our adopters about the information we do have. So you're taking you're taking uh, pets off of the streets, and you're trying to figure out the match. Um, how do how do you deal with the age of a pet? Because a uh, younger pet is easier to find an adoptive home for than an older pet. How do you deal with that? For me, that that's pretty simple. It's about marketing. Um, people need to understand. Personally, I wouldn't want a puppy. Um, <laughs> They're really cute, um, but they're a lot of work. And you got to think this is going to be the next 
10 to 15 years of your life? And are you prepared for that? And those are conversations that we have. Our vet team is great at identifying age. We can discuss the parameters around that. And senior dogs, senior cats are just as loving. And if they, you know, it's about quality of life, period. Um, and we can really help to coach people, you know, like we've talked about before, that conversational adoption of, are you really ready for a puppy that's going to chew on your shoes all the time, that you just love your shoes? Or do you want somebody that we know is house trained, who has been around children, you know, those types of things that we can help them out with? Liz, you want to weigh in? Sure. I would echo quite a bit of what Carrie's saying. It does at times come down to marketing. Um, we have a lot of senior pets here. We do take in owner surrenders, not just from our immediate area, but from all over the state and even beyond. And when those pets come into us and they have a story or we've gotten as much information as possible from their previous homes, that's great. Um, we're able to use that information. We're able to test them out a little bit for ourselves. And then we're able to market them appropriately. I recently had a retiree who came in looking for a puppy and left with an eight-year-old, overweight, but very sweet lab. And I don't know who was happier, the dog or the gentleman. It just <laughs> absolutely the perfect match. And that just speaks to what we all do. We all talk about making the match. We all want matches that stick. We prefer not to get returns, but if they happen, it should be a non-judgmental process. Again, it should simply be about, okay, what did we learn? What can we learn from this process? Sometimes matches don't work. Most of the time they do because we're very thorough in what we do. Now, Edward, you, you have three different operating units and you're, you're involved in very different environments. Could you just sort of describe the different challenges that you face in Boston, Dedham and, um, and uh, Cape Cod? They're all interconnected in many different ways. All over, and we're very, we're very lucky that we're in different communities. And if an animal is, will be better on Cape Cod, for example, that in Boston, we have a transport wagon that transports the animals back and forth between our locations. So we're really able to evaluate each animal individually and find out where is the best place for this animal to be until it is adopted. And we also take in large animals, pigs, horses, goats, you, you name it. And so we serve those animals in our Dedham and our Cape Cod location. And surprisingly, a lot of our pigs get, get adopted from Cape, in Cape Cod. So we have a pig now in Dedham that will soon move to, to the Cape for, for an adoption. But I wanted to touch on, Mark, what you and Carrie were discussing with animals that aren't owned. We have a very big, we call it a community cat program. We kind of, um, we remove the word feral from the cats. We have, we have a community cat issue in Massachusetts and in Boston. These are cats that are living outdoors. Some of them are feral. Some of them are indoor outdoor cats that, that are owned. And some of them are cats that were owned that people moved and they left their cat outside. And what happens is when cats are left alone to their own devices and they're not spayed and neutered, they have more cats and it just kind of spirals out of control. And so we started a program a couple of years ago, hiring special agents that would go out into the community. So if a community member calls us and tells us, I see these three cats in my backyard, I need help. We go out, we meet somebody, we assess the situation, say, oh, you don't have three cats. <laughs> you have 30 cats. You're only seeing three cats. How can we help the community? First, we educate and we work with the community to understand what these cats are and what they are not. And how do we help solve the problem? And part of the way to solve the problem is working with the community to, as Carrie mentioned, TNR, a trap, neuter, return. And what turns out is, 75% of the cats that we're able to bring into our facility to spay and neuter, we are able to adopt out. And the, these cats are friendly or semi-friendly, but most people that have cats in their household know you don't, cats are cats and you don't, you, you live with them and you take care of them. <laughs> That's what you do. Um, and then also finding the kittens that are born in the wild, taking them. And sometimes you only have a short window to socialize these kittens. So we have a program called Taming Tiny Tigers. And we have a whole group of volunteers that when we bring in these semi-feral kittens, we smother them with affection and with human care. And these cats kind of try to fight us, but then they break and they realize they really want to be loved and they really want to sit on somebody's lap. And that sets that cat up for a very success, successful adoption. So it's, it's, it's really critical, um, the work that we do in the communities. 
Well, it's also your your training human beings as well in terms of, of showing affection and and uh, making yourself vulnerable, you know, and and you're doing it in a way where look, let's let's face it, we're all traumatized by so much in this in this society. Uh, to be able to do it with a non-judgmental uh, being um, and and really being able to sort of grapple with ourselves in that process is so is such a gift, particularly for for young people, um, and it's something that can stay with them forever, right? We 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 actually have partnerships with human service organizations, and our latest partnership is a group in Boston called the Base. And it is an after-school program for kids in, in, in certain communities that need something to do after, after school. So we have a partnership with, with the base where we have some of those young folks coming to our locations for that exact reason. Um, we had a young woman join us over the summer who was transformed by her work with the animals. She was helping the animals in so many ways. We didn't realize the transformation that was happening in the young woman. And when she went back to the base, when we would talk to them and they told us, this is a new person. The confidence this person now has in themselves and what they found by working with the animals, it was truly transformational. And what you said, Mark, was completely correct. It, 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 goes, it definitely goes both ways. You know, I think real quick, one thing we saw during COVID too, and this just went all over, was uh, domestic violence. And we have a program where we work with domestic violence uh, folks, whether it's a, a man or a woman that's being abused. It's, you know, research has shown about 70 percent of houses, the people won't leave if there's a pet involved. And so we have worked with our uh, domestic violence folks, you know, groups here to take in those pets until the family can get re, you know, readjusted and then reunite the pet with them. Well, we started with Liz. We're, we'll end with uh, Carrie. Uh, this has been fantastic. One of the things that this really does show show me, this conversation shows me, is the interconnectedness um, of of all these different uh, organizations of us as people um, across the country. Um, and I'd like to really thank you, uh, Liz Scrovish, Executive Director of the Animal Rescue League of Southern Rhode Island. Dr. Edward Chitino, President and CEO of the Animal Rescue League of Boston, and Carrie Burns, CEO of Santa Barbara Humane. Uh, it has just been really wonderful to have you share your experiences with us. And it, what was interesting to me, particularly interesting to, to me, is this impact that you have on the greater society. Um, this is not just about uh, pussycats and dogs and rabbits and domestic pets. It really is about how we interact and having a healthy community. Thank your staffs, thank your donors, uh, thank your supporters, your volunteers, and, and thank your constituents. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.